out to their car. Children abducted, forced into boot camp overseas. Is it a lifesaver? I have my daddy back. Or something else? He had sores all over his feet, his chest, his legs. What's happening in Paradise Cove? There's something sinister going on here. The first Bob McEwen here. on abduction for hire. A scene of unspeakable horror, a mass murder, and there's best. But what do you do if your child gets caught in a cycle of self-destructive or even dangerous behavior? Some desperate parents are turning to a drastic solution. They're having their children abducted, taken against their will, to a tough behavior modification program far away from home. Does it work, or can it do more harm than good? Here's Bob McEwen. Daddy. Happy birthday to you. Thank you for that lovely singing. It can happen anytime. Hey. For David Von Blarigan, it was just after his father's birthday party. For Danny Kohler, during a family vacation. Most likely, it'll be in the middle of the night, while you're sleeping, like it was for Stanley Gould. Then the men lifted me up out of my bed. Two of them had each of my arms, and they just kind of dragged me out to their car. They had handcuffs and tasers to restrain me, and they were very large. The next part is more or less the same. You're taken from your home to a psychiatric hospital, perhaps this one in Utah, where you're examined and evaluated. Then you're sent for treatment to a guarded compound thousands of miles away in another country. It wasn't really until I was actually in Samoa and sleeping on the floor that I realized, okay, this is it. For Danny Kohler, it was welcome to Western Samoa, to a place called Paradise Cove, where sleeping on the floor is only the beginning. This home video shows the Spartan conditions that Paradise Cove brags about. Hot, humid weather, bad food, big bugs, no TV and no privacy. Usually it's months before you're allowed even one short phone call back to the U.S. Was there a point at which you said, I just want to get out of here, I want to go home? Oh yeah, all the time. I wanted to leave that place. This is what is broadly known as an emotional growth program, a place that takes troubled teens and tries to mold their behavior. What I found in my experience with kids working with 20 years, 5,000 kids, is very few of them change because someone sat down and had a talk with them. Bob Litchfield founded Paradise Cove in 1994. He's now a consultant to that program and to several others that deal with problem kids. You're talking about more than the run-of-the-mill problems of adolescence, more right. than just a little teenage rebellion. E exactly. Maybe they've tried counseling, they've tried different options, and nothing seems to be working. And so Which is precisely how the Kohlers felt three years ago. Our family was falling apart over it. Their son Danny was then in the 10th grade, using and dealing drugs at this upscale high school near San Diego. How old were you? Uh, 15, 16. And what drugs? All of them. Mainly marijuana, LSD, crystal meth. And if things had gone on the way they were going at that point, what would have happened? I would say that he'd be either dead or in jail. So the Kohlers made what they call the toughest decision of their lives. Well, on vacation in Las Vegas, they had Danny taken by force and sent to Western Samoa, to Paradise Cove. And I remember I broke down and cried. I was hugging him. Maybe we were part of the problem, but I was devastated. I didn't get over that. Maybe I'm not over it. In addition to its harsh lifestyle, Paradise Cove features 24-hour-a-day monitoring by no-nonsense Samoan chaperones and continuous indoctrination in personal responsibility and the value of families. It was six months before Danny was allowed to call home, more than a year before his parents were allowed to visit him. But then, the Kohlers were stunned. I don't think I could say it was just the greatest moment of my life. Why? Because he beams. He's healthy. He shines. He's loving. When I saw him, it was great. I had my Danny back. <laughs> Danny Kohler would stay in Western Samoa for a year and a half, breaking old habits, working his way up the ladder of leadership in the Paradise Cove family. You guys are great, buddy. <laughs>
<laughs> and I was a family leader and I was like, wow, you know, these people look up to me. This is something I want to keep doing. This is something I want to take home with me and use, use to better my life. It's the kind of success story that's triggered an explosion in the teen behavior modification field, tripling the number of programs just two years ago. Are there kids who respond in the opposite direction? Are there kids for whom this is simply not the right thing to do? Having worked with 5,000 or so uh, children in my career, I don't think there's any child that I've met that hasn't been positively influenced. Just don't try to convince Stanley Gould of that. What did the kids who had been there a while tell you this was going to be like? They said it was going to be hell. He was mutilating himself with, uh, you know, he would, sh he would come home and he would have scars in his arms from where he'd taken a cigarette butt and burned his arm. But for Gould's divorced mother Jane, Paradise Cove was the last resort. She says by 16 her son was into drugs, even self-mutilation. He uh, was suspended from school, expelled from school. Why? For carrying a weapon, a uh, knife. Yeah. She thought the answer was a place where you simply weren't allowed to break the rules. It looked like a Nazi death camp. It did not look like any fun. What happened if someone said, I don't want to be here, I'm not learning anything worthwhile, and I'm not going to do it anymore? Well, that would depend on who he said it to. He would either get a consequence or he would be physically assaulted. What would that, that would, entail? That would entail, uh, you know, holding a kid's arm behind his back, punching him, kicking him, pushing him, throwing him. What is the policy at Paradise Cove concerning physical discipline or punishment? The policy really is that uh, it's the last resort. It's only, there, there is no such thing as physical punishment. There's only physical restraint. In fact, the enrollment contract signed by Jane Gould and other parents allowed Paradise Cove to do a lot more than that. I think the contract mentioned handcuffs, pepper spray, electrical disablers. Okay, okay, I don't think any of those uh, electrical disabler, pepper spray, mace had never been used, to my knowledge, of Paradise Cove. It's, it was in the enrollment agreement for very rare situations where safety and life and limb were in danger. That specific clause has since been eliminated from the Paradise Cove contract. But Dateline spoke with other parents, parents who had definite concerns about how their children were treated in Western Samoa. Okay, senora. One of those parents is pediatrician Ronald Skufka. Though the annual cost of Paradise Cove is $35,000, more than a year at Harvard, it had seemed worth it to cure the drug and alcohol addictions of his two sons, Nathan and James. At least that's what Dr. Skufka thought, until he discovered that the Samoan Health Department had investigated the program's sanitary conditions. The report found numerous problems, including overcrowding, poor sanitation, and inadequate cooking and washing facilities. They had no refrigeration and no running water. And they had no bathing facilities whatsoever. My son told me he did not see a bar of soap for five months. When Skufka was reunited with his older son, Nathan, he couldn't believe his condition. He had sores all over his feet, his chest, his legs, his, his arms, hands, and face. And he was a mess. Today, Eric Schlunniger of Tulsa, Oklahoma, is an active 18-year-old. But a couple of years ago, when his father Bill saw him after just a few months at Paradise Cove... He had sores on his feet and then all up his legs and uh, a lot of sores on his arms. I'd say about 80% of the people at least got ringworms sometimes when they were there. And uh, well, scabies, I think, was another thing that people were getting. Back in the summer of 1996, the Western Samoa Department of Health threatened to shut Paradise Cove down if sanitary conditions there didn't improve. The people running the program made the required changes, and Paradise Cove has since been given a clean bill of health. But what most alarmed Bill Schlunniger about the place he had chosen to help his son 
was what he says happened when he and his wife attended a support group in the U.S. for Paradise Cove parents. First, there were the rules. No one would take aspirin during this uh, seminar. No one would drink Coca-Cola. No one would drink coffee, any caffeine products. There would be no one that should have sex during the, this uh, program. And I thought, we've come into the wrong room. There's some, you know, they're trying to recruit some people for a cult here. You know, this is the wrong place for us. Even worse, the Schlinigers say that as part of the program, one of the Paradise Cove speakers verbally attacked a skeptical mother. And he says, you know, I could shoot you right now, I could blow your heads off, or I could just take you and rape you if I wanted to, and you couldn't do anything about it. And I said, well, right now, I'm, I'm ready to, to load up and go get my son. Because, you know, there's something sinister going on here. That was when the Schlinigers brought their boy home from Western Samoa. We felt bad about it. We felt, you know, terribly guilty about sending our kid to a place like that. He's moving forward again with his life. I think it's taken him about a year to recover from Paradise Cove so that he can do that. Dr. Eric Nelson is a psychologist who treated Eric Schlinniger upon his return to the U.S. He was angry, he was hurt, he was scared, he was unsure what this experience was that he had been through. So he was essentially lost. Dr. Nelson also treated another boy, who he says still shows the effects of the treatment he received at Paradise Cove. In terms of really being almost bewildered by what this was supposed to have accomplished, a lot of anger, uh, and really a sense that he had been uh, brainwashed. Oh, I think it is brainwashing. It's 100%. Litchfield tells us he's not familiar with these individual cases. But he believes that Eric, Stanley, and the Skufka boys would have had a positive experience at Paradise Cove if they'd only stuck with it. And he says the same goes for the seminars. He claims that virtually all the parents who complete the three-day program are satisfied with it. But according to Stanley Gould, 11 months at Paradise Cove was long enough. He claims that things seemed so bleak that some of the boys concocted a terrible plan to get out. Rumor was that if someone died over there, that the program would shut down for six months. And so a few kids had made a knife-like object, and they were planning on stabbing a kid in the neck and killing him so that they could go home. Even if it meant going home to jail, it was still worth it to them. Would I be shocked by that? No. Because... Really? An alleged plot by adolescents to, to commit murder, and that doesn't oh, shock you? Believe me, these kids brought that with them. And if you're trying to say that the environment created that, no. No, they brought that with them. But if that's true, where are the child psychologists or counselors on the Paradise Cove staff? People trained to deal with such serious emotional problems. Now, if you read the brochures for Paradise Cove, what isn't there is any discussion of the experience or the expertise or the credentials or the academic qualifications of the people who are teaching these kids. Why is that? We hire people with good youth leadership, uh, have some talent working with youth. I think I'm talented working with youth, but I don't have a quote college degree in that area. And so I, I, I personally don't believe it's necessary. But when you're dealing with troubled kids, and seriously troubled kids as you describe them, is it not necessary to have someone who knows about that in academic detail. They change because of the experiences in their lives. And so that's what we're after, an experience, not a, a counseling type of situation. Whether that's the type of shakeup that will help them in the long run or not, it can be questionable in some ways. Dr. Eric Nelson and other psychologists tell us that counseling is what most troubled teens need. The more punitive types of programs, the ones that are run like penal colonies or like prisoners of war camps, are more likely either to create a lot of anger and rebellion against, uh, in the child that emerges when he or she returns home, or, if I may put it this way, breaks the spirit of the child so that creativity and spontaneity and uh, a real motivation toward the future can be lost. Bob Litchfield has provided Dateline with testimonials from dozens of happy parents. And he tells us that a recent internal survey shows that 96.6% of the parents whose children complete the program are satisfied with it. But Litchfield also acknowledges that for a variety of reasons, 60% of the teens who start never finish the program. 
and he has no follow-up studies on any of the students as to how they do after they leave Paradise Cove. And there's another question. Remember the psychiatric hospital in Utah where kids like Stanley Gould and Danny Kohler were examined and evaluated to medically determine if they should be sent to an emotional growth facility like Paradise Cove? Well, last year, the state health department investigated that hospital, officially called the Brightway Adolescent Hospital. Authorities found that those medical evaluations were really just form letters. Stanley and 14 other patients they investigated got exactly the same one, and that the treatment had been predetermined and paid for before the examination even took place, a package deal that included the abduction, transportation, and confinement at Paradise Cove. And whose company did we discover was running that psychiatric hospital? And really, Bob Litchfield's. My, again, let, let me clarify Brightway. Brightway is probably the program I've had the least amount of involvement in. Managed by your company, however. Well... According to the Director of Licensing for the State Health Department, managed by your company. We don't own it, but we do a management contract with it. Okay. Litchfield later told us that the patient evaluations appeared to be form letters because the treatment plans are on computers and because most of the diagnoses are very similar. Since we spoke to Litchfield, his company's contract to manage Brightway Adolescent Hospital was terminated. The state of Utah temporarily revoked the hospital's standard health license, and the owners of the hospital plan to reopen under different management. Yeah, she's an actress. But in San Diego, at the home of the Kohler family, they consider Danny's experience at Paradise Cove a terrific success. They say without it, he might well be dead instead of on his way to college. When you came home, how different do you think you were from when you left? Oh, I know. I, I know I'm different. And I have some goals for myself. Is I have a life ahead of me. But Stanley Gould, the Skufka boys, and Eric Schlunniger say they had a different experience. Nathan Skufka has completed a 12-step program and is now working. His younger brother James has battled with drugs but hopes to graduate from high school. Eric is out of school and working too. Bob Litchfield says the program probably would have worked for these boys the leader. had they only given it more time. When you're the best in the business, you're under the most amount of look and monitoring. Some people are going to perceive us in a very bad way. Other people are going to perceive us as saving kids' lives. As for Stanley Gould, he says he's no longer getting into trouble. He's now enrolled in a community college, studying to be a psychiatrist. His mom credits the program in Samoa with saving his life. His dad, with whom he lives, disagrees. He says his son is doing fine now, in spite of Paradise Cove. Sitting here now, Stanley, do you believe in some way, as unpleasant as it might have been, you're a better person because you did that? As better as I would have been going through Vietnam. The United States has no laws to protect American children in overseas programs, but at the request of the State Department, Samoan authorities have opened an investigation into Paradise Cove and two other similar programs for American teens. Coming up, the story behind